Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Chris Coyne. I'm the youth pastor here at Portland Community Church. And I actually want to start by telling you a little bit about uh, camp this week. We had middle school camp at Tapawingo this last week. And let me just tell you, we had 13 from our church go. So that was really exciting. Um, but we also had, brace for it, 94 middle school campers come this last week. And I definitely feel like that's how many we had after this week. I am exhausted, but it was an amazing week. God did some really awesome things in our students and in other students across the camp. It was just, it was just one of those camps that just went super smoothly and God was just working. It was amazing. and It was really fun. So thank you for praying for us. Uh, that was, uh, we really appreciate that. And so this morning we're going to talk about a Christ-like response to government. And, and you can already imagine, this is a rough subject, okay? This is gonna be something that is uh, difficult for a lot of people because we have very strong political opinions. It only takes us like 30 seconds, probably even less nowadays, to look at Facebook to see how contentious this is right now, political issues. You see people posting their articles about their political opinion, and then you have people posting their stuff with their political opinion, both sides of the argument. And let me tell you, as a people pleaser, and someone who struggles with anxiety, Facebook is like the most terrifying thing for me right now. Like to even step foot and be like, do I even say anything? Can I share any of my opinions? I even got yelled at by someone on Facebook one time for sharing a, an opinion about sports. Something that's like not that big a deal. But that's the kind of climate that we live in right now. We live in this very divisive culture. And actually, uh, you probably can tell if you've been on social media recently that it's getting worse and worse. The divide is getting bigger and stronger and more deeply ingrained. And honestly, looking at what is happening right now makes me very, very fearful for the future of our country, but more importantly, but also for the future of the church in general. Not just our church, but the church as a whole across the world if we cannot figure out what we need to do as a result of this. Because here, here's the thing. Uh, for us as Christians, for those of us who are our followers of Christ, our job is to act in a Christ-like manner no matter what we do. And so we have to look at these things and our goal is not to necessarily be right about our politics, but instead to be righteous before the God that we love and serve. That is far more important than being right. And so when we look at this political divide, we know that within our church that we have people from both sides of the argument. And so, and there are good Christian people who are, are on both sides of that discussion, people that I love and respect and, you know, truly believe they are a follower of Christ. So the question then becomes, what do we do as followers of Christ? How do we respond to the government authorities in our lives? And how do we navigate this very contentious, uh, contentious culture that, and climate that we live in now, especially from the last election? And what do we do if we dislike our governing authorities? Or what if we really truly like them and like what they're doing? What do we do? How do we handle that? And then how do we have a civil discourse? How do we have a way so that we can have a, a civil discourse about these political issues so that at least in our building, in our church, in our congregation, we are not divided even if the, if the country continues to be more divided. And so as we'll see today, no matter where you land in terms of the political spectrum, the need is for us to forsake our desires to be right and instead to focus on honoring and submitting to authorities, praying for their good, praying for them to come to know Jesus and to do good where we live. These are the important things. And so that we're going to look at three approaches for a Christ-like response to government. So we have three main verses we're going to look at. I'm actually going to invite you to open up to all three of them. Okay, first to Romans 13, 1 through 7. So have maybe your pointer finger there, maybe your thumb, whatever you want to do. And then secondly, you're going to be in, we're going to be in 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 through 4. And then thirdly, we will go look at 1 Peter 2, 13 through 17. So have, have, be ready to turn there. Um, we're going to look at them one at a time as we look at what it is that God would have us do to respond to government and other kinds of authorities in our lives. So let's go ahead. I'm going to start reading Romans 13, verses 1 through 7. 
Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. And so right away, we need to make a mention of something. We look at this passage and Paul says, let everyone be subject to governing authorities. The word he's using there is this term submission, to submit to governing authorities. And notice that he uses that word instead of the word obey. Because if he uses the word obey, that means that we are supposed to do every single thing that the government tells us to do. And we'll talk about this in a few minutes, but there are going to be times where we will have to say to the government, sorry, I can't go there. I will not obey that law. I will not obey that rule. And we'll look at some biblical examples of that. So he uses the word submit because what we're supposed to be doing is recognizing, submission is this idea of recognizing who is in authority over us. That we look at them and we say, okay, they are in authority. They are responsible. And look at what the passage even says, that God has established them. God is the one who has put them there. So as soon as we start to go down this road of saying, I'm not gonna submit to a governing authority, even if I really dislike them, even if I really do not agree with their policies. If we go down that road, what we're really saying is, God, I am rejecting your sovereignty. I'm rejecting your control over the world and its uh, events and the history of the world that you are not in control. We're saying to God, God, I trust myself more than I trust you. Because God, it says, it says this in the Old Testament that God sets up kings, he removes kings. God is the one who's in control. And we see this a lot in the Old Testament where God, where a, and in the New Testament too, where a king kind of gets a little bit too full of themselves and, and God says, okay, that's it, you're done. And there's flat, it's done. The king either dies or goes crazy and insane and can't be the king anymore, okay? God is the one who is in control. And so what submission shows, submission shows a true change in a person's heart, okay? I've seen this in my own life. I've mentioned this before when I've been up here. I have a very stubborn personality, very, very stubborn. I must always apologize to my parents and my wife um, for that personality, okay? But I've noticed the more and more I grow up in my relationship with Jesus, the more that I am recognizing that even if I disagree, even if I don't like a rule that's been put upon me, if I'm the one under the authority, I have to submit. I, even if it's something that's, you know, especially with something that really doesn't, doesn't make huge difference. But this is the standard that Paul is calling all Christians to, is to submit. Now keep this in mind. You have to understand this when we look at the historical context around the, all of these passages. This was at a time where Christians were actively being hunted to be killed for their faith. And so this is the level at which Paul is saying to submit. You submit. You are subject to these authorities. You are to do good. You are to continue to do good in the land that you live because that is what is God's will. Notice that he says that you don't just do good because that is something, you know, just so you can avoid punishment. You know, you don't just uh, uh, obey the speed laws just so you won't get a ticket. It's because of conscience, he says in verse 5 because of conscience, because you know that it's right. You know that it's what you're supposed to do. And the conscience is the idea of God's will and purposes for the world that we are trusting in those more than we trust in ourselves. So actually our first approach that we, that we have is to, that we are to submit to all who are in authority over us. All. The Bible makes it very black and white. So whether it's a governing authority, local, federal, whatever it is, okay, or if it's a teacher in your school or your class, a principal, a coach, or a boss at your work 
even if you really don't like them, even if you really don't respect them, your job as a Christian, your duty is to show them respect, to show them honor, and to submit to them because they have been put there by God. And that is very difficult for us as human beings who want to control, who want to say, okay, this is, these are the conditions upon which I am going to do it. But when we look at verses six and seven, what Paul is saying when he says, this is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants. So you're giving, you're paying your taxes because you're giving to the government so the government can do their job, which is to, as Paul says in this passage, is to promote good. And, and then this is, remember, this is the ideal uh, job of the government, the ideal purpose. Not all governments have done this, Okay that the job is to promote good, to punish evildoers, to, to try and corral people into a way so that we can have a good and flourishing society. That is the ideal governmental situation. Now we know there are times where leaders and men and women have abused that power, but our job is still to submit to the laws of the land. Now we do have to ask this question, what, at what point then do we then obey God rather than men. Let me give you, I'm gonna give you three examples. First, you go to the book of Daniel. There's two of them in there because this is when Israel is in exile in the land of Babylon. They have been captured and taken away as a punishment for their disobedience to God. So they're taken away and now they're told, okay, you need to live righteously. You are going to reveal me to the people of Babylon. And so then there's these three guys with really fun names to say, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Um, we never, that, those are their Babylonian names. We never focus on their Hebrew names because they're weird and too hard to say, apparently. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, really fun to say. These three guys are work for the king, work for King Nebuchadnezzar, a very you know, widely known historical king in Babylonian history. And what happens is Nebuchadnezzar gets a bit of a big head. He builds a statue of himself and commands the people to bow down and worship it. So basically making himself out to be God. Well, now he's just set himself out on a path for God to prove, him, prove to him that he's not God. And he does that in the book of Daniel. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say to King Nebuchadnezzar, nope, we are not going there. We're not doing that. And so even if you're a person like right now that's thinking about, if, if you look at our government you're think, and this is your opinion that, oh my gosh, things are getting really bad, really bad. We haven't reached the point yet where our governing leaders have built a statue of themselves that we are supposed to worship on penalty of death. We haven't quite gotten there yet. So let's bring it back a little bit, <laughs> okay? And so what happens here? is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say, no, we cannot do that. And so they submit to their punishment and they are going to be thrown into a fiery furnace. God rescues them from it, pulls them out, and then Nebuchadnezzar kind of goes the opposite direction and says, oh, if anyone forsakes or blasphemes your God, they should be killed. Okay, whoa, slow down, Nebuchadnezzar, too far. Okay, then you go into Daniel chapter, or Daniel chapter six. And when you actually meet Daniel, he is told that he is no longer able to pray to God. He is only to pray to the king. Daniel says, nope, not doing that. I'm going to pray to God. And he continues to pray to God. He doesn't try and hide the fact. So eventually he gets arrested and he gets thrown into a den of lions. And again, God saves him. Okay, third example. We look at Peter and John in the book of Acts, the two, two of the main apostles of Jesus. They're going around preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. This happens in Acts chapter four and five. And they get arrested for preaching the gospel and they are brought before what's called the Sanhedrin, the Jewish religious council, like the Jewish relig religious leaders. And they tell them, stop preaching about Jesus. And you know what they say? Nope, sorry. And this is the phrase, we must obey God rather than men. And so this is where that line is drawn, is when we say, if a governing authority starts to tell us that we can no longer practice our faith, that's where we say, sorry, no thanks, I'm gonna continue following Jesus. 
I am still going to go out and preach the gospel. I am still going to study the word of God, even if it becomes illegal, and I will willingly face the consequences of that decision. And so again, this is our first approach, that we are to submit to all governing authorities, all authorities that are over us. And remember, this is, what, this is God's desire for our lives. This is exactly what he would have us do. Go ahead and turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2. We'll look at that passage. I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God, our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Paul uses this term, this term of or using all these different terms of prayer to talk about in every form, shape of prayer, you are praying for the leaders of your land. Oftentimes we use this passage to try and say, okay, we, we need to pray for them to have wisdom, to have guidance, to know what it is that God wants them to do and to follow it. And those are all good things to be praying for. But when we look at what this passage is actually talking about, you look at verse three and four, the idea of praying for them comes out to seeing them come to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. So this is our second approach, is that we pray for the salvation of those in positions of power. It's more than just saying, God, we pray that these people would follow your will, that would obey you, to have wisdom to direct our country. Those, that's a good thing for us to be praying, but mostly what we're praying for is for these leaders to be saved, to come to know Jesus Christ. And the purpose as Paul says here, so that we may live peaceful and quiet lives. It's not a peaceful and quiet lives where, you know, so the government, become, the government leaders become Christians and so now, okay, cool, I get to lay back on my hammock, read my Bible whenever I want, and just enjoy the freedom that I have been given. That's not what he's talking about. It's this Greek phrase that means a tranquil life free from the hassles of a turbulent society. That's the Greek term that he's using here. And what this is about is being able to live in an unhindered ability to live the Christian life, to spread the gospel, to share the good news of Jesus Christ without hindrance from the government. Because this is what Paul is experiencing at his time. At his time, he is having all kinds of government um, oversight that's trying to tell him, you can't preach the gospel here. You can't preach it here. You can't preach it here. And Paul is still continuing to say, nope, I'm going to preach it there. I'm going to preach it there. I'm going to preach it there. And you can't stop me. This is what I'm going to do. You can arrest me, but I'll preach it there too. And so the whole thing here is that so that they, so that Christians be able to, to freely go and spread the gospel wherever they possibly can in an unhindered way but then he also says that we are to do this in godliness and holiness. These are two characteristics that reveal a godly character that is observable, okay? An observable character of godly life that emerges from truly knowing God. When we truly know God, there should be an obvious and marked difference in our lives. It's not just this head knowledge of like, okay, I believe in Jesus, cool, that makes me feel nice. That makes me feel good about myself. You know, puts a spring in my step for my day. What this actually is, is it should say, when you give your life to Christ, there is a change in yourself and that the culture would look at it and see, this is something we can respect. This is something that we can see as something that is good and right for people to do. And this whole idea, and, and, and sometimes Christians are unfortunately are not known for this especially in our country, and it's, it's heartbreaking to me. Because then you have some of these ideas of the holier-than-thou idea or the Bible thumpers who just smack the Bible over people's heads who don't agree with them. Or you have holy rollers, okay, highly emotional. And you start to see that these are hard, these kind of mentalities are hard for people to, outside the church, to respect, they're not living in a manner that is revealing God's love and God's holiness and God's grace to all the people. And so what we are to do as Christians, this is, is supposed to be an attractive way, an attractive way to live. And so again, remind, remember, this is all about praying for salvation of our leaders. And so even if you look at a leader and you look at them and you say, I despise that government authority, I wish they would never have authority. You know what we need to be doing? praying for them 
to know Jesus. So if you're a Republican and you're looking at the Democratic leadership of our state, because we're in Oregon, okay, you're looking at the Democratic leader, leadership of our state and you're saying, I am not happy, I do not like them, I, that's okay, you can have that opinion, but your job as a Christ follower is to pray for them that they would know the saving love and grace of Jesus Christ. And if you're a Democrat and you're looking at the government leadership that we have right now that is very Republican, and you're saying, I don't like them, I don't like what they do, I don't like how they handle themselves, I don't like what their, their policies, your job is still to pray for them so they would come to know Jesus. Because here's the thing of what this reveals. Because what this shows is that we have to believe that no one is beyond the saving grace of Jesus Christ. There is no human being that is on this earth that is beyond the possibility of being saved by Jesus. Paul himself, who wrote this, is probably the prime biblical example of that. You could characterize Paul as a terrorist before he came to know Christ. He was actively searching for and trying to kill Christians until God radically just said, no, mo no more, I'm done with that, Paul. I'm gonna reveal myself to you so that you will be my follower and you will bring my message to the whole world. And, this, and his message through Paul has gone throughout the whole world because the Bible is spread all around the world. The man who was actively trying to stop it is now the most, probably the most famous Christian person besides Jesus himself. And look at what, Paul, and what God did. We cannot, we cannot get to this place where we start to think that certain people you know, deserve to have Jesus and certain people don't because guess what? No one deserves it. Or that we would categorize, you know what? I don't like this person, so I'll, God, I don't want them to have it. That's Jonah's idea. When you read the book of Jonah in the Old Testament, that was Jonah's mentality. God, these people, I really don't like them. I don't want you to save them. We don't want to be a Jonah. That is not where we want to go. And so again, when we look at this, our whole idea, our whole mindset is to say, we want to see all people come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, even the worst of the worst of human beings in our, in our world. I remember a few years ago when uh, Osama bin Laden was killed and there was a lot of rejoicing and you know, there, there should be some thankfulness and gratitude that a man of that kind of danger was um, removed from the earth and in some way that was probably some of uh, God working his plan um, to take care of the evil that that man had been perpetuating. But at the same time, there should be this slight, this slight feeling in our heart that says, God, that's, that's heartbreaking that that man was so hateful that he couldn't see your love and your grace. And so we should be heartbroken that that man never came to a saving relationship with Jesus Christ, no matter how evil he was, no matter how horrible he was. We can't sugarcoat it, but we still say, God, my heart breaks for that man that he never knew the love that you have shown to me, the love of Jesus Christ by dying on the cross for my sins. I did not deserve this. And so, that is our second approach. Go ahead and turn to 1 Peter 2, and we'll look at our third and final approach. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority, or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. So Peter almost says the exact same thing as what Paul says in Romans 13 that we looked at earlier. So he's saying, this, he's, he is having almost the exact same line of argument. So you submit to every authority because God has put them there. So you're submitting, by submitting to those authorities, you are submitting to God himself. And that this government was, its ideal purpose is to create laws that could promote a flourishing society, to punish wrongdoers, to promote good. The ideal government situation. And so it is our job to, and it is our job to submit to them. But look at what he says, verse 15. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. That ignorant talk of foolish people, what that was, what, what Peter's talking about is there were rumors circulating about Christians that they were, because of the fact that they were proclaiming Jesus as the ultimate king, as the, um, 
as a king, even over Caesar himself, that they were trying to take down the Roman government. It was a nasty rumor that was being spread. And that couldn't have been further from the truth because that was not Jesus' intention at this time. His intention was not to set up his political power yet. What he was setting up was his kingdom of saving people from their sins and redeeming this world from the brokenness that we have put upon it. And so it is, he's saying it is God's will that we should do good, that we should, and the good is, again, to submit to the laws of the land and so to obey them so that the, you know, this foolish talking of ignorant people can look at it and go, wait a minute, I thought these Christians didn't care for what the government says, but look at them. They're obeying the laws. They're paying their taxes. They're not grumbling. They're not complaining. They're not whining. They're simply obeying they're si or simply submitting. What, what are, that's different. That is not what I thought. And so it's to silence them. But then look at what he says next, verse 16, to live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Because here's the temptation. Because as Christians, we have been set free by Jesus Christ. When we put our faith in Christ, okay, we believe that Jesus took, upon, took all of our sins upon himself onto that cross, and that when he died and was buried, that our sins stayed there. Sin and death were defeated on that day and stayed in the grave when he rose from the dead. And so now we have been set free to live the life that he has called us to live. But that doesn't mean that we get to now go and do whatever we want, including up to saying to the government, sorry, no thanks, I'm gonna do whatever I want and not listen to you, even with the laws of the land, okay? That's not what we are to do. We are not to, and so Peter even calls that an evil mentality to think that you can just go and do, you know, ignore the laws of the land. Can't do that. And so what's happening is Peter is reminding that, first of all, he says, look at what he says, live as God's slaves. Now that word is so, so loaded in our culture because of the atrocities of what happened through uh, the slave trade, okay? But what, this is, what he's talking about is this idea that we have been bonded to God, that we are now, our life is now God's. He owns us, owns our life, and has a stake in saying, this is what I want you to do, this is how I do it, and he is a good and loving father and master of our lives who would never treat us like those people did during the slave trade era. Never would do that. So we look at our lives in a different mentality. We look at our lives and say, okay, I am God's slave. I am going to do whatever it is that God tells me to do, even if I really don't like it. That is the way that we are to live. So look at these examples of what he gives, how we could live as God's slaves. First of all, to show proper respect to everyone. So that we show respect to people, even those we disagree with, that we treat them with dignity, respect, because we know that every single person that has been created has been created in the image of God. And by that, that means I have to treat them with respect, even if I really don't like them. Even if I really don't want to, I am to treat them with respect. Okay, so we must, our attitudes, especially towards people we disagree with, always must be led in respect for them as image bearers of the one and only God. Then secondly, he says to love the family of believers, to love our fellow Christians, meaning to love each other in a manner like Christ has loved each and every one of us. So I love you in a way that Christ has loved me, which is I give myself up for each and every one of you. I give my life so that you may know the love of Christ. And we do that all for each other. Every single one of us that are in the body of Christ, that is our job to love one another. And so again, if you disagree with someone, your job is still to say, I love you and I will give my life for you because you are my brother or you're my sister in Christ. That is a bond that goes way deeper than simply which party you check on your voter's card. It goes way deeper because it's sealed by the blood of Christ and not sealed by your personal signature. So that's, that goes way deeper. Then he says, fear God, that we show ultimate reverence for who God is, what he has done, 
and that we will follow him with our lives and we will trust in him to do what he has called us to do. But notice that he uses a, a softer term than fear for the next one, to honor the emperor. Again, our ultimate and priori um, prioritized authority is God himself and then governments. And so our job then is to fear God, to know that he is in control, to trust in him, to know that there are consequences for decisions that we might make that God is trying to orchestrate in our lives to more align us with him. And that we honor the emperor, no matter if we dislike them, whether we like them, no matter what, we show them honor because God has put them there. And when you actually look at the New Testament and how some of the apostles handled their situations with some of these government leaders, they showed them a lot of respect. Paul, in particular, when he would be brought up before these governors and these kings to uh, give his testimony as to why he shouldn't be in prison, he always said, honoring and respectful terms, not just because he's trying to manipulate them so they would set him free, but because that's what he knew he was supposed to do to show them respect. So lastly, our third approach is that we honor those in leadership and that we do good where we live. We do good by obeying the laws of the land, that we seek to be people who have uh, an honorable way of living that no one can look at us and find even a hint, a hint of where we are disregarding and disrespecting government authority that could say, they're, they're trying to tear apart this world. They're trying to tear apart what we have built because people will view that as threatening. So this is our primary job. So in closing, I have a couple little thoughts. Notice that I said nothing today that had anything to do with a particular platform or political opinion of my own. I have them, and a lot of times I try, I, and I, tr I should say I try all the time to base them totally on what Scripture says and what I believe God is telling us to do. But we cannot get into this place where we start to mix um, the teaching of the kingdom of God with this idea of American nationalism. They are not one and the same. Our allegiance goes first to God's kingdom and second to any earthly government or country that we might live in. And so if you ever hear this idea that Jesus is a Republican or Jesus is a Democrat or Jesus is Greenpeace, whatever it could be, don't believe it. He's not one of those because he's Jesus. He had much bigger concerns for this world. He was, he was far more focused on the fact of seeing people live righteously, live in a manner that would reveal who he is to all the people. He wanted his people to spread the gospel to share love with other people, to love enemies, pray for those who persecute us and, and disagree with us, and not to try and gain political power. None of this was Jesus' concern. Someday, all of that will be his and much more. Someday, he's going to return and he will take over and he will inaugurate his actual physical kingdom here on earth. But truly, Jesus' main concern is for us to live out the realities of the kingdom. Listen to this verse. This is from Matthew 6. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Our primary concern as followers of Christ, seek first God's kingdom by loving the unlovable, by, try, by seeking to, to heal the brokenhearted, to care for the poor, our job, and to spread the saving message of Jesus Christ. That is our number one thing that we do. And secondly, to seek his righteousness, that we would be the kind of people that God desires for us to be so that we can make an impact on the world that we live in. And then secondly, I believe Satan, one of Satan's favorite tactics to try and destroy God's work here on earth is by division, by trying to divide us. So I am going to implore you as one who struggles with this as well, do not let your particular set of political opinions be the dividing thing in this church. We can't do that. 
because there are things that are far more important than that. So even if that you know someone in this church and you say, man, I really disagree with them, I really don't like what they say, they are your brother and sister in Christ and that is bonded by the blood of Christ. That is more important, more, goes more deeply. And so when you have conversations or you have disagreements with those people, you know what you do? You seek to be humble, to listen. Doesn't mean you, ha- you have to change your opinion. Always in everything, our opinions should be submitted to the word of God and what God would call us to do. But that we treat those we disagree with even in our church, with humility, with respect, with honor, with dignity, and not trying to just win the argument. Because what that shows is that we would be just like the world. Because you can see it. Our world is, especially our country, is going kind of crazy right now with this divide that's growing. If we can show in this building, in this church, that we can still be divided, or that would be bad, still be united despite our differences. That that shows that the gospel really does have some impact and some truth and some weight to it that goes beyond simply uh, religious ideas. So strive to dialogue on these issues in a respectful, Christ-like manner that reveals his love, his grace, and his mercy. And so remember, A Christ-like response to government is to submit to all authorities, to pray for their salvation, to show honor to all uh, all who are in authority, and to do good in the land that we live in. And that is what our response is as Christians. Let's pray. God, I'm just so thankful for your word that, God, that we just that we have the opportunity to let it bear weight upon us, to tell us this is where we need to go, this is what we need to do. God, this is how we are to live. God, how else would we know how to honor you, how to, um, how to live the life that would please you? And so God, I pray for, uh, I pray for all of us that we would, we would know and love you and God, that we would seek to follow you with every bit of our lives and to recognize your authority over our life over and above everything else. And God, as a result, by extension, we would submit to governing authorities. And God, that you would give us wisdom for the times where we need to say, we will obey God rather than men. So again, God, thank you for your word and thank you for this country that we live in. God, that we do not have to fear one bit that someone would come busting in the doors and arresting us for holding a church service. And God, we think of our brothers and sisters in Christ across the world who deal with that reality every single day. Help them to navigate these passages and what it means to submit to their governing authorities who are so restrictive of their religion. And so God, we we love you. We thank you for this and we give this to you. We pray this in your name, amen.